Mark Twain. He's kind of like the Yogi Berra of the 1800s. Uh, this is a great quote, always do right. <clears throat> this will gratify some and astonish the rest. Um, how many have it challenged, been challenged with doing the right thing, uh, getting into the gray zone and trying to make a decision? Everyone here, right? Everyone here. And, uh, and so I was sort of intrigued when, when um, uh, Babette called me one day. Are we set? That'll, be, that'll go forward, yeah. Okay. Are we set with our slides? Your slides? Okay. Uh, about the idea of sharing our experience together. And as I started to think more about our uh, conversation today, it seemed like it was more, um, I wanted to play the role of a, a facilitator and ask a few questions and maybe give people an opportunity to share your experience because everyone has a story. And I hope that you'll be willing to do that uh, this morning. Um, so. Uh, the way we use an audience response system is that we were going to have some, some specific questions and uh, there, we'll start with rather simple questions and we'll get into some more interesting questions uh, and we can maybe share and talk about it a bit. Now, we can't, we can't vote yet because you don't, do you have your... Uh... Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, you, you, there's also an afternoon session. We may get it figured out. <laughs> You're welcome to come back. Um, but maybe just with a show of hands, uh, there's four categories. Let's start at the top, fabricators. How many fabricators do we have here? Okay, maybe about, about uh, 10, 15. Uh, detailers? Detailers, excellent. And architects? I threw architects in just to see if there were any architects in the, in the space, none. And structural engineers? The majority of structural engineers. Okay, thank you. Uh, let's see if I can get this right. Steve, I'm not moving ahead. There we go. Uh, and then I was going to ask a bit about how many years uh, in the industry you, you've had. Um, with zero to five, you show of hands. Zero to five, uh, six to 10. Yep, uh, 11 to 15. Okay, uh, 16 to 20, plus 21. <laughs> and so what would it have done, it would give us some percentages and we can kind of understand our demographics for this morning. Um, and then just tell us where you're from. Uh, northeast, New York, uh, northeast part of the country, okay. Southeast, a couple hands. Uh, Midwest, yeah, Minnesota, <laughs> Minnesota. Uh, South Central, Texas. Uh, s uh, Northwest, Washington, okay. And Southwest, okay, a little bit more here, a little more convenient. <laughs> I think they fall into both category five and six. <laughs> um, okay, so I just sort of buying into a little bit of the controversy earlier this week. And if for some of you who have been here most of the week, there's been a fair amount of discussion about uh, the Code of Standard Practice. And, and uh, many of you, particularly in the central part of the country and the East Coast, are aware of uh, connection designed by fabricators. Uh, in California, it's been uh, prohibited by code for uh, up till now. Maybe that'll be changing. Um, but I just was curious, just to get uh, your reading on this part, part 3.1.2, how many were here for Charlie Carter's presentation? Okay, so you know what we're talking about. This has to do with the issue of allowing the fabricator to design connections based on loads given on the drawings. And I'm just curious on opinions, because there are some strong opinions on this. Uh, are, are you in favor of this? Yes. And are you not in favor of this? Almost, almost equal. Okay. How many in favor of Yep, yep. Uh, there are some pluses and minuses to that, that whole concept. Uh, in, in my practice, we've been doing that for a lot of years. We're, we're centrally located in the country. We have a lot of steel, competent steel fabricators in our area. And, and uh, collaboration with our steel fabricators, talking with them frequently is a very common thing for us to do. And so for you know, recognizing that there are economies in the shop, uh, we don't have a lot of seismic related issues or specialized connections to think about from that perspective that it, it feels like a comfortable space for us to be in as, as structural engineers. Uh, however, excuse me. Well, your key word there is allowing. Right. If you change that word to requiring, then you probably have a lot more no votes, especially among the Sure, sure. If you, if, you show, if you show connections but then allow the fabricator to design his own in lieu of those, 
Sure. Sure. It, it is characterized in the Code of Standard Practice as an option. So that's why you chose that word. So I wanted to talk today about professional ethics, um, uh, effective leadership, ethical leadership, building relationships, and ethical conduct that I think lead to building trust. And trust is a, is a huge factor in functional organizations. Profitable business or ethical businesses? Ethical businesses build strong communities. <coughs> Having a sense of what's going on in your in your world around your neighborhood, uh, you know uh, the idea that maybe some form of pre-tax profit in your organization goes to support some of the nonprofits in your organization or, or in your community. Building strong communities through strong ethical practice within your firm. So I, I was roaming around looking for guidance on this topic because I, you know, I'm a structural engineer. I'm not a lawyer. I'm not a, a, a psychologist. But I, I found these words of Gandhi, and I thought he really got it. Now, he was referring to violence, but I thought you know, in some way there's a relationship to uh, ethics here as well. So I'll just read these. Uh, wealth without work, pleasure without conscience, knowledge without character, commerce without morality, science without humanity, worship without sacrifice, politics without principle. So you think about those words. They're powerful words. Gandhi got it. So, have you ever had a significant ethical issue in your professional career? Sure you have. Um, how many yeses? Everybody has. There aren't too many no's in here yet, unless you're at maybe the zero part of your career. <laughs> Would anyone just take a couple of minutes just to tell, tell this group about that experience? You, you, you saw ethics and accountability on your uh, document that you received when you when you came this week you've been thinking about this you chose this seminar over other opportunities tell us about maybe one or two maybe you can tell us the story anyone be willing to do that yes sir Inevitably, there's something wrong. So I have to deal with that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Just the idea of getting paid. No, the idea of there's something wrong. How do you know? I work for the fabricator, but there's something wrong. Do I just say, well, it's not that wrong and sign off on it? Mm -hmm. Or do I force the issue, piss off the fabricator, and never get another job from him? Which you know, if that happens, it happens. Mm -hmm. Because then I also don't get paid, which doesn't help. Mm -hmm. Thoughts on that dilemma? We're in that same business, and yep. it comes up all the time. And the first answer out of my mouth when I think about it is, what do you want me to do when I find something wrong? Because mm -hmm. I want that up front. Mm -hmm. Do you want me to tell you how to fix it? Do you want me to report it? You know, where do we go? Mm -hmm. Right, right. Everyone agree with that. Everyone else, uh, anyone else, any other stories? Yeah, that issue happens daily in the structural engineer's office. I'm a structural engineer. You're always in a fabricator, contractor, someone calling you instead of drawing, saying someone else produced whatever they want to stamp it. Right. Uh, that's always an ethical issue. Uh, you know, I do want to comment before you can go on about that. Being a registered professional structural engineer, or a professional engineer, a structural engineer, uh, every state has an ethical right. and moral clause right. that you swear to. Right. You become the engineer. We'll get into that. <laughs> that's right. You're absolutely right. It's a daily issue. Um, plan stamping. We don't see it so much in, in anymore, um, but most states have plan stamping. Uh, huge prohibitions against that. Um, we have a saying that came from our secretary of the board in Minnesota a number of years ago where he described just real simply, he who designs or she who designs signs. But that's, that's a pretty straightforward one, but I'm sure a lot of people are challenged by that dilemma. Does everyone understand that plan staffing issue? 
Well, thanks for sharing those. Especially in this economy. Yes, right, right. Uh, the challenges, the, the ethical challenges become a little higher, as Babette mentioned earlier in her opening remarks. Uh, have you ever had a significant ethical issue in your professional career? We talked about that, and, and uh, are we, we're still not quite there. Um, so I did a little research, and we found there's a number of studies that have been done. Uh, this one was uh, performed by the uh, Ethics uh, Center. Uh, and there, there are some observations that I just threw on the slides here, and we'll just kind of share those with you. Misconduct in companies is very high. More than half of employees see misconduct on probably a fairly regular basis. Employees are fearful of retaliation and skeptical that their report will make a difference. Does that resonate with anyone here? Have you ever reported something to a supervisor and, and, uh, and then nothing happened? You ever had that experience? Yeah, one person. Um, that, uh, this goes to a whole, the whole issue of strong ethical culture, an ethical culture that promotes what you might even call dissent. The idea that as, as a leader of my firm, I want that woman over there to let me know if she's feeling uncomfortable with something, whether it's in the office or on the job site. And that, my friends, is a pencil dropping, phone putting down type of message to me. I, I want a very strong, uh, I, I send a very strong message to my employees that I don't, I, there's zero tolerance for that type of, 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 of uh, experience that anyone might have that makes them feel uncomfortable or unsafe in their work environment. Employees are fearful of retaliation, skeptical that the report will make a difference. Do you agree? with this statement. Just a show of hands. Yep, yep. Um, in, uh, further on in the survey, the, the quality of your ethics and compliance program matters. Ethics and compliance programs yield positive results if they are well implemented. How many here work for companies with ethics programs that are a code of ethics or uh, an employee manual that deals with behavior related issues? How many? Right. Um, it's updated every year, I presume. Uh, and is there a discussion about that? Do people in your firm, your leadership, talk about ethics on a regular basis? Or if it's, is it just a, a manual that's handed to you at the beginning of the year and it's put in the shore and no one talks about it? So I'm having a hard time answering that question without our slides here, but give me a show of hands for those that really talk about ethics on a regular basis within your work environment. A couple, just a couple. Okay. Now, do we have uh, our, has everyone has their deal? Okay. Excellent. Uh, coupling a strong ethical culture with a strong ethics and compliance program is a path to the greatest reduction of ethics risk. We'll talk a little bit about ethics risks. The reward to your company, employees, and stakeholders is significant and can be quantified. Okay, so here we'll practice with our new devices now. Uh, does your company have a written code of conduct? I mentioned it earlier. And if so, is, is it supported by senior management? Yes, we have a code. Yes, we have a code, but it's not supported. No, we don't have a code. Now, let's see how this works. Give it one more key forward, and that'll start the countdown plot. Okay. So this gives us a little timer, Steve, that okay, everyone has to answer within that 10 seconds. Okay. Correct. Okay, so uh, interesting, yes, we have a code that is aggressively supported. So I, that's it's a little stronger than I, I saw in the show of hands. Um, but what's also interesting is that uh, more than half the firms are, don't have a code that is supported aggressively by senior leadership. Um, and I strongly believe that having a, a, a culture that is uh, uh, aggressive with regard to enforcing, being available, talking about it, uh, just in, in improves the, uh, the climate and in, in, it raises level of respect and level of ethics in all the activities of employees. Uh, if it's not talked about, it's forgotten about, it allows those risk factors to uh, creep in and, and, and perhaps uh, become uh, uh, a, a negative influence. Four elements that shape a strong culture came out of this study. Ethical leadership, supervisor reinforcement, peer commitment to ethics, and embedded ethical values. About half the companies surveyed in the U.S. today have a strong or strong leaning ethical cultures. The point of this slide is that um, it was disappointing to me to see that only 9%, and that's that top blue category, 
have a strong, strong ethical culture. A strong enterprise-wide ethical culture dramatically decreases misconduct, increases the likelihood of reporting, and, re and reduces retaliation against employees who report. Ethics risk is reduced by enterprise-wide cultural approach to ethics. Misconduct's cut by three quarters of percent when you have, or three quarters by, uh, when you have a, a strong culture that doesn't tolerate um, misbehavior or even inappropriate actions in the gray zone. I'll talk about that a little bit. Ethics risk is reduced by enterprise-wide cultural approaches to ethics. Uh, what we're seeing here is the percentage of employees observing misconduct has returned to previous levels, and this is sort of comparing, this is a fairly recent study that compares before Enron and, and some of the other uh, fairly significant uh, six o'clock news ethics issues that went on for an, a number of years, uh, before Enron and after Enron, and, and the, the complacency perhaps of enforcing an ethics culture, promoting an ethics culture, is starting to kind of set back in again amongst uh, the, the firms that were studied in the survey. As negativity increases in the work environment, more employees observe misconduct, and it has a strong impact on morale. Morale is something we uh, think about and talk about as leadership in my organization almost on a weekly basis. And it's something we think about quite a bit right now, particularly in the challenges that we're all facing in this economy. Now, probably like your firm, my firm has had some staff reductions, we've had some salary reductions, uh, but what we've done with our staff has been very open and transparent about why. And it's, there's no, no confusion about what's going on in the economy. You see it every night on the six o'clock news. And, and so it's interesting that as we explain why we're doing what we're doing, and we talk to our employees honestly and transparently, our morale is, is as high as it has ever been. And it, it's very interesting to see how just being open and honest with your, your decision making can have such a strong impact on your, on your uh, business. Uh, a negative work environment, I thought these were some interesting points, I'll just read a couple. Uh, lack of satisfaction with information from top management. You're not getting the information that you think you need. Uh, there's, the, the top management is siloed or not even apparent. Um, lack of satisfaction with information from supervisors. Lack of communication. Um, just do the work, don't ask questions. Uh, in this economy, especially with uh, young, our younger generations, our younger generations and our staff want to know, they want to know why, and they want it right now. And so it's, it's, it's interesting, we'll talk a little bit about generational differences as well today. Uh, lack of trust that coworkers will keep promises, commitments, as well as supervisors. Rewards, this is interesting, rewards for employees who are successful, even if it is through questionable means. And we've probably all seen people who have uh, maybe seen some spurts in, in success, at, at, uh, at maybe the expense of an ethical or compromised ethical situation. Okay, we have another slide. Is ethical misconduct an issue in your work environment? If so, how often is it observed? And I just take a couple minutes to look at the slide. No, yes, once a year, once a month, once a week, and daily. If it's happening daily, why don't you give me a call? <laughs> So I, I moved to the timer, okay. <clears throat> okay. Well, so we, we do have some that see it daily. <laughs> that's, I'm, 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 I feel sorry for you guys or women that are in that situation. That's gotta be very, very disappointing and frustrating. <clears throat> 41% is a pretty strong number. It probably maybe is a little disproportionate uh, as, we, uh, as we compare our industry to perhaps other industries. Um, but those of you that are seeing it uh, once a month, once a month, uh, can you tell us a little bit about what you're seeing? What industry are you in and, and uh, what, what is the issue that you see on a fairly frequent basis? Incorrect, but it's not within my my uh, my uh, special 
inspection scope of work, right? And so, am I or, or am I not ethically required to at least mention it? Because if you, if you can see that it's wrong and it's installed incorrectly, and the possibility of the facade may fall off the building, I would say that's ethically you're required to do that. Well, that's a great example. Yep. Sure. That's, that's a great example. Uh, I have a couple stories like that. It's, I'm sure others here, particularly on the structural engineering side as well. I'll share my story. Uh, I, was, I was designing an 11-story hotel in uh, Lansing, Michigan a number of years ago. And it was cast employees, post-tension concrete. Post-tension concrete, I'll be honest with you, is probably where my area of expertise is strongest. Um, and so I was climbing the tower and doing just what you were doing, looking at the slabs. In this case, the exterior wall system was a masonry with a steel stud backup. And the steel stud uh, installation was just going very poorly. And I started to notice that. And it, it was sort of a performance spec. It was a delayed submittal uh, issue. Um, and so we had reviewed the shop drawings and approved it. Uh, but the installation side was going very poorly. So I, uh, after finishing up my work on the post slabs, I. I spent some time on the scaffolding, and I climbed the scaffold, and I took a lot of pictures and made a lot of notes. And then I, I went back to my office in Minneapolis and called my client and said, we have a problem. And, and I, I laid out the issues. Uh, I got everyone together, including the contractor, major, major uh, national recognized general contractor, and we sat them down and said, here's the problem. Here's what's happening. Here's my recommendation. And one of those recommendations was I wanted to have a full-time testing company look at what was going on on a regular basis because I was there maybe once, you know, about every pour, so once a week or so. I think the pour cycle was seven to ten days. And that turned things around overnight. I'll give you another example. And this is maybe a little over the edge. Uh, in Miami, I was designing a nine-story PT project, a convention center and hotel. And I, I was up on the uh, top floor and I noticed a guy kind of hanging out a window, buttering up head joints on a masonry wall. He was not tied off. Now, in Miami, uh, if you don't speak Spanish, you don't communicate very well. So I went back down. I literally stopped what I was doing. I went back down to the trailer. I found the superintendent, and I said, see that guy? And I pointed out. He was just a couple of steps away from a nine-story fall. Now, I definitely went over the edge. I mean, that was not part of my contractual responsibility to account for safety, but I had a moral res responsibility to, to respond. And so doing the right thing, whether maybe I, if I you know, had a consequence to pay for that, that was, that was why nothing happened, and he was fine, and I think someone took care of tying him off. But I think, as, I think you have to think about those opportunities to say something. That's, that's essential, I, I think, in terms of who we are as engineers and detailers and fabricators and, and just people caring for those around you. All right. Uh, one further on in the study on, on, uh, from the Ethics Center, uh, one in four companies has a well-implemented ethics program. I think we're kind of seeing that here in our own numbers today. Deloitte did another study on publicly traded companies, and they found that in America, anyway, 83% have formal codes of ethics, but uh, only 25% uh, monitor them actively. And I think we were seeing that a little bit here in our own poll. Um, just a few other facts, 35% or fewer of the companies use a third party to manage their whistleblower helpline. Some of the larger companies uh, have a 1-800 number where you can call and you can indicate something is going on in your group. Most of us in structural steel or uh, uh, as structural engineers work for relatively small groups. So uh, it's a little more intimate. So sometimes we may not have the problems that larger organizations have with, with leadership and transferring uh, the leadership vision of ethics down to uh, uh, the workers within the organization. <clears throat> the average structural engineering firm in this country is probably about seven or eight people. So, does it pay? Uh, in this study, uh, we, they compared uh, uh, the S&P 500, which we all are familiar with, uh, with uh, uh, companies that were, they felt were the most ethical companies. And we were able to see in here that this line here represents the, the companies that really shine from an ethics perspective. And they evaluated a number of, of characteristics from retention to uh, community involvement to um, uh, 
just a number of characteristics that allowed them to kind of measure and, and establish some metrics. It was an interesting study showing the difference between two companies. In your opinion, does it pay then to be ethical? And have a look at that. Think about that. One through five. Strongly agree. Uh, I think that uh, I, that's, that that I, I, ten, ten, I very much agree with. Um, I think over the long haul, it's that sometimes you could see people take getting advantages in the short distance, but in the long haul, if your if your reputation is one of uh, ethical behavior, ethical response, ethical treatment of your clients and your colleagues, from the long term perspective, uh, that will be uh, definitely where you want to be from a from a profitability perspective, from an employment perspective. And so some of the firms that came out on the list that were um, uh, high ethics are recognizable brands in our country. Uh, business ethics varies by culture is another observation we were, we came up with as we were putting our our presentation together. In, in, in America, the words were equality and fairness. Uh, we have a lot of laws that govern uh, uh, equality and fairness. Uh, larger corporations spend a lot of money dealing with the whole issue of compliance, compliance checking, compliance testing, lawyers and actuaries and accountants. In the Middle East, uh, it's etiquette. <laughs> I was doing some work for a district cooling company in the United Arab Emirates. Maybe some of you have worked in, in the UAE or other, other uh, Middle Eastern countries. And I was met uh, at the airport in the middle of the night when you arrive there. Uh, by uh, a colleague from the company and he quickly told me there's a few basic rules you need to know. First of all, as a man, you don't get into an elevator when there's only women in the elevator. Number two, you don't show the bottoms of your shoes to anybody. And number three, did that ring a bell? <laughs> and number three, if you're in a cab and you're in an accident, you're all going to jail. So I, I thought about those words as, as the cab driver was whisking me down to the hotel at 80 miles an hour, uh, hoping that that wouldn't happen. <laughs> Etiquette. In, uh, in, in, the, in other areas, uh, in, the, in Japan, loyalty to the company. A friend of mine uh, used to uh, do a lot of electronics business in the early 80s on the Pacific Rim from his location in San Francisco. And he, he told me regularly that it was very difficult to develop real business relationships and it just took time in the, on the Pacific Rim. He was working in South Korea at the time to, to develop trust and relationships that were reliable. And it, it took a long time to develop the level of business he was looking for there. In Europe, we talk about morality. So have you experienced ethical dilemmas based on working with different cultures? Some of you, I think there was some nodding of heads when I mentioned the Middle East. Uh, take a couple minutes to just... Uh, or a couple seconds to throw your number down. Okay. For those of you that have experienced ethical dilemmas, can you share what uh, what that was, or give us a little detail on on what the facts were and how you resolved it? So, this is ten years ago with another company, but I'm with now, and we were looking. At Right. And they basically have a agent system that we consider bribery and stuff. Mm -hmm. And our company decided to back totally out of the market. Yeah. Yeah. <coughs> yeah. Exactly. That's fairly common outside this country. Anyone else experience that you could share with us? Um, so just a slide kind of summarizing what we talked about. 80% of the U.S. companies code of conduct. Codes of conduct are based primarily on U.S. legal requirements. Compliance again. We have to do it. The Sarbanes-Oxley was legislation that came out of the, the whole Enron crisis and debacle. Uh, created requirements for companies to report. You, you, you know, they, they were trying to level the playing field perhaps with, for ethical companies. Um, I, I sort of, as a business leader, I sort of chafe a little bit at, at rules and regulations that require me to do the right thing. I don't need a lawyer or the law to figure out how to do the right thing, but it's there. Well, it's all ideas. Is engineering an old profession like it was 100 years ago? Yep. And, and we are professionals. We are, we are professionals. Uh, our machines are technicians. Right. 
right? Right. Uh, I, I would agree with that. I, I would say it's probably the majority of us do, but there's always a few that just kind of spoil it for the rest of us. And, uh, and and maybe society doesn't quite understand why we do what we do, but we have a lot of rules and regulations that we have to follow just technically. And and the and, and the legal reporting requirements of large organizations are there because of the end runs of the world. You know, uh, you know, or even uh, even uh, our recent one with. Um, our, our friend in New York, who was, you know, uh, and we'll talk a little bit about that <laughs> in a couple slides from now, but it, it is a bit frustrating that we have to deal with that kind of environment, but as engineers, we're, we're, we're used to following rules, and we're used to following regulations within our technical codes, um, but it is interesting to know, to think about the U.S. having such a heavy compliance requirement that it, it requires us to be ethical. In Europe, it's not quite as significant. So more than 50% have codes of ethics, but uh, less than 20% of the codes are legally driven. So we think about our culture, and I was spending a little time thinking about how we're influenced by our culture. Uh, so we have the founding principles of our country in terms of freedom and equality and the rights of the individuals, all to set up uh, a very uh, aggressive and uh, robust capitalistic uh, economy and society that we can do freely what we want to do. We can choose to become social engineers because that's what we want to do. That's not that the, the, the country has assigned us to do that or someone else has figured out that's what we want to do. That's, we, we've made that choice. But then in modern influences of mobility, we're able to move around the country quickly, communications, uh, news media, internet, civil rights, and globalization. Communication. When I was uh, I was working doing that those uh, cooling plants in the east, the uh, far east, these were EPC contracts. But my role was pre-design, code evaluation, and then peer review. And and uh, the the analysis was coming back and forth <clears throat> between myself and the peer reviewer, just like it was you know in the next cubicle next to me. They were using STAD at the time. This is about ten years ago clearly understood the I, I, I thought that the design was you know not real you know, not 100 percent but it was there we, we could communicate effectively all the way around the world transferring our documents through the internet we talked a little bit about uh, licensing a little earlier this morning uh, I've often been intrigued by Florida I'm, I'm registered in, I think in all these states here uh, Florida is, has stood out as a, kind of an interesting experience where I've done a few projects down there most recently in Orlando here this past year um, uh, when I first arrived in Florida, I did a project in Miami about oh, 10, 12 years ago. I was driving to meet the client for the first time, and uh, on the news, on the radio, they had just arrested a structural engineer and a contractor, and they were hauling them off to jail for some, something they had done in violation of the code and, and, the, and civil law. Uh, well, that's interesting, but they, at the time, the state of Florida didn't have any, any continuing education requirement. Now they do. But the continuing education requirement came with a lot of angst and a lot of, a lot of challenge going on. There was a lot of debate within the uh, professional societies about what the extent of, uh, the, of, of the continuing education requirement should be. So they finally, after a lot of debate, came up with a biannual, biannual requirement of like eight credit hours, half of which, half of which need to be in rules and laws. Now how many, any registered engineers in Florida? You know what I'm talking about. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> You know, the rest of the states, my state, for instance, it's 15 credit hours per year, 30 biannually, in, in technical areas that we're all uh, practicing in. You, you make the choice, but it's in, to encourage uh, that we're staying uh, in touch with what's happening in our professional areas. But half in the state of Florida need to be in the areas of rules and laws. And the rest of these states also have requirements that are similar. So who are we as people? How is our value system established? What drives our decisions? How important is transparency? Uh, how helpful is the internet? Uh, should, should ethics be, be taught in schools? How many had ethics training courses when you were in college? Okay, that's, that's good. I, I didn't think it would be that many. <laughs> uh, how many have ethics training, uh, in, uh, formal ethics training within your organizations? Okay, there I gotcha. <laughs> No one. <laughs> um, so uh, uh, AACSB is, a, is an organization that represents business schools and uh, some conclusions they came to after uh, a, a recent study was that it was indiscriminate, it was unorganized, and it was undisciplined. 
So the emphasis on ethics training isn't really there. We, we, in, from an engineering perspective, we teach physics, we teach math, uh, we understand design, we understand codes, we understand design principles, but there's not a lot of emphasis on ethical training. And we, we, at the expense of, well, in, in favor of our, our technical competence, which has to be there. But as you spend time in the world, and you spend time with people, uh, it comes down to relationship building that's really important. Uh, we make contracts with our clients. We process, we get questions like this gentleman had from, from his client. That whole plan stamping issue was something that really reared its ugly head here in the early 90s in my area. And uh, we had a lot of very hard conversations about that and, and came to some good conclusions as a community about not, not doing that and clearly recognizing where that line was. So, have you had formal ethics training either in school or on the job? I'll, we'll have you just answer your question here that I just asked. I, I went to college in the, in the 1970s and there was absolutely no reference to uh, ethics in that, at that time. So yes, we had 29% in school, 58% or more, more than half have had no, just my experience as well, no, no ethics training. Uh, did you notice a difference, different understanding of ethics with new associates, people that come into your organization? Do you see any difference between uh, your organization and people coming in? And maybe that's a little dip, more difficult question to answer, but give me your thoughts on that. Okay, about 50-50. Then we talked a little bit about generations earlier and generational differences. I've kind of thought about this a lot as I look at my staff it ranges in age from 22 to 86. So there's a lot of generations. We've got four of the five generations of, that are alive today within my organization. Uh, do you notice a difference in understanding of the ethics between generations? Let's see how that compares to our earlier answer, our previous answer, question. Get the hang of this. Okay, that's interesting, isn't it? Uh, what, taking the generational question out of it, it's about 50-50, but adding generational differences into it changes the answer. Anyone comment about that? Go ahead. Devices and just good work ethics and not, you know, sure. That sure, sure. How do you, how do you, go ahead, sir, sorry. I was just going to say, I think the, uh, I don't know that it has so much to do with the, uh, with young people and older people, but I know that in the, the history of America, I mean, the, the ethics that we had 100 years ago were probably largely based on a, a more like a faith based ethics. Mm -hmm. And then I think as we've gone along, maybe in the last uh, 30 years, it reverted more to a morality-based ethics mm -hmm. uh, because maybe religion kind of moved out of the way. And now uh, we've gone to a legal-based ethics. Compliance-based, right. I think it's just the, uh, the way America has gone is we more and more uh, relinquished our, our faith or even our morality, and now we're just doing what we're told to do. Mm -hmm. and, uh, there's still plenty of people who would like to have a faith or morality-based ethics, but... It's, it's being overshadowed by the fact that now, like you said, we have to do it. Mm -hmm. It's telling us we do it, whether we want to or not. Right. It doesn't have to overshadow personal character right. and personal strengths and personal beliefs that we all bring to our work. Um, we had a gentleman here, zero to five, right? <laughs> do you have some thoughts on, on, we had a zero to five, you? Yeah. yeah. In terms of that, that generation, how would you respond to that? One thing we do in, in my organization is have a strong mentoring program. We have, oh gosh, uh, maybe 15 practice committees in our group of, of 
63 right now, we're down to, from 75. Uh, uh, practice committees that, that influence decision making right up to the top, and it's, 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 it's really neat because we can involve younger people in some of these practice related issues right away in their professional career so they could be around senior engineers, understand the decision making process, how do we deal with certain issues, and they can have a, it, it helps their career and it helps generate uh, some, some good positive information and decision making skills. Um, but there are definitely differences between our generations, and I, I always get kind of frustrated when I'm editing documents that are written by you know people right out of college. It feels like I'm editing a text edited message, <laughs> you know. So I, I, I talk with I don't want text editing anymore. We have to be clear with our words. I want you to be able to go to this file in two years and pull this file out and tell me what happened and be clear about it. Uh, I chair our risk management group and, and uh, it, it, creating a record is, is huge and having a good strong record in your file if there is a claim related issue down the road that you're able to defend yourself, that you have a good strong extemporaneous record and trying to help them pick out what should be recorded and what should not be recorded is, is a real challenge as you all know. Well thank you for those comments. Um, so I, as we think about what influences us in our world, you know, there's, I, I have this real thing for the 10 o'clock news, if it bleeds, it leads. It just, just really seems to really violate ethics, <laughs> my own sense of morality. Uh, it, it's titillating, it's intended to sell their, their, their products. About all I'm interested in on the 10 o'clock news is what's the temperature going to be tomorrow morning at 5.30 when I go out for my run? It shuts off. Um, we talked a little bit earlier about the human weakness, and here's some images that sort of represent what's happened in this U.S. Uh, over the last 10 years. So we have uh, Mr. Bogoyevich in, in Chicago. We have the whole impact of the Catholic Church, uh, what happened in that organization. And then old Bernie here with $60 billion. What happened? And it, you don't get to necessarily that point overnight. You know, you're, you're, you, you, uh, maybe it starts with small things and you go from the real black and white, which makes sense, I understand right from wrong, and you end up maybe moving into a gray zone in a gray area. And we probably all know people who kind of operate in that gray area. I have a friend of mine that, that I always kind of, I struggle with what he's doing because it feels like it's kind of in the gray, I don't quite understand it. Um, and and as, as kind of that, you, you start to compromise one thing, I think Babette started to maybe make, make a mention of it earlier today. Uh, all of a sudden it seems easy. It, all of a, and, and pretty soon, in, in the case of Bernie's situation, it felt normal. It was normal. It was what he did for a living. This gentleman was the leader of the NASDAQ. He had a very public uh, position and a very responsible position. Sure. Sure. At what point does a normal person, as you say, step over that line and greed controls? Right. Nothing else matters. And we've seen this monstrous thing. Sure. We have a kind of a similar story to Bernie, not quite the same order of magnitude in, in Minnesota right now, a guy named Tom Petters. And uh, Petters owned a group called the Petters Group. And that organization owned uh, recognizable brands like Sun Country Airlines and uh, uh, Polaroid, I think. Same thing, it was just a Ponzi scheme, selling stuff he didn't have. Greed, fear, greed, arrogance, um, disrespect, a lot of characteristics that kind of settle in. And then I think what happens is it, it starts to feel normal. You know, <laughs> my experience of feeling normal is that, you know, if I leave the office before 6.30 or 7 o'clock at night, <laughs> It feels a, a little unnormal. My, my day has creeped longer and longer over the last three decades I've been doing this business. And I, don't, I, I just feel so uncomfortable when I leave at five o'clock like a normal person. <laughs> uh, where do we come from and, 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 and what have we inherited from those who came before us? Uh, we talked a bit about mentoring, how we can share as, as senior engineers, senior detailers, and, and, and senior members of a fabrication organization with the younger people, our younger staff. How can we uh, be cognizant of the need to transfer uh, a set of uh, uh, moral ethics uh, from one generation to another? How are we influenced by our experience and how are we resistant to change? 
Um, I was talking to Steve, our, our event planner here this morning, about an organizational change that happened for him. Uh, they were changing technology within their organization, and, and Steve was a senior guy saying to the junior people, we have to make some changes, and I thought your comment, Steve, was interesting, is that what's wrong with this picture? I'm the one that wants to change. I'm however old you were at the time, 45, and everyone else in this organization in their 20s say, no, we're, we're comfortable with this technology. Change is important. How are we resistant to change, and how does that impact ethical decisions that we make? Uh, Charles Taylor is a famous author, uh, authored a book called The Ethics of Authenticity, and I thought just a couple comments that caught my attention here about, you know, uh, uh, situational ethics. Uh, cultural relativism taken to a, a extreme is moral anarchy, the strong words, interesting words to think about. And the two uh, comments at the lower part of the slide, two intertwined bad ideas, that you are wonderful just because you are you. How, how contemporary is that? thinking. <laughs> and, and then secondly, that, the res that respect for difference, and think about this, respect for difference requires you to respect every human being and every human culture, no matter how vicious or stupid. Uh, those words just kind of resonated with me as I thought about my own experience as an engineer and, and, and a businessman. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> okay. Does the end ever justify the means? <clears throat> okay, maybe. That's what I thought. I thought I would just throw that on there to see what, what kind of reaction we might get. get, get give me a couple, a couple of reactions to the maybes. When, when does the end justify the means? You know, I can think of an example. What if, uh, you know, this is very simple, but uh, if my wife is pregnant and uh, all of a sudden I need to get, get her to the hospital, uh, I'm okay running red lights in the middle of the night, right? That's, that's against the law, but I have a higher calling to get her to the hospital safely. Exactly. Okay. I would not know this because I believe that would be situational ethics, and that is no ethics. Right. Right. What if she dies because he because he was stopping the lights? The whole civil rights, civil disagreement. Yeah. I'm sorry. It's not about red lights. It's about the whole issue. No, it's a very simple little example, but. There are more complex examples in life, and I just thought I would start the thinking. This gentleman back here, just about say that again. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Sure. This country was founded on people that uh, took the law into their own hands, right? qualified that. Everything's above board. So presumably you're operating ethically. That's the means that you use to get to the end. Right. So I, I, again, I'm just looking at it out. I think most people took that as a relatively negative sure. question. Sure. No, that's a good observation. There are times when ethics way out of business. Sometimes you have to do it ethically, whether or not it's against business practice. Right. Yep, look yourself in the mirror every day. 
Exactly. Yes, sir. My question is a little bit generational in that in my age, I see that as a Marxist position and respond accordingly. Uh huh. Culture I was brought up. Sure. Uh, a couple of generations later, they didn't experience that. Right. So we're going to look at that thing. Absolutely. Uh, just what what does it mean to to justify? You know what 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 are the means? Are, are, and you're, you were saying that well, it's a negative statement. Yeah, we think the means might be a negative means, but if the means were a positive means, were uh, a, a compliant means, an ethically, then then it's, then it's correct. But what we're saying is, does the means overcome any any justification, any rationale? Okay, so uh, the black and white zone versus the gray zone, talked a little bit about that before. So have you ever lied? Yeah, probably, but it's clear. It's in the black and white zone. Um, have you ever sexually harassed an employer or subordinate? That's a pretty controversial question. You know what? Every woman in this room and every woman in this organization has a story. Um, ever cheated on a test? But then get into the gray zone here and ask a question, uh, have you ever withheld your uh, uh, acknowledged ability to contribute or contribute to solving a problem because it would take too much time, might cost you money, might put a business relationship at risk? And guess what? I want you to answer that question. <laughs> and let's 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 talk about that question. So 40% might cost you or your firm money, so we back away from involving ourselves. Any thoughts on that? Comments? Your experience? Why did you choose that answer? It's a tougher, tougher question to, to um, maybe explore in a group like this. In the tundra, on the tundra. When you're, when you're, uh, when you're designing a school and, and uh, the architect has an architectural feature out front, uh, some monster canopy that they want to do, and they they start throwing these sketches. You let your young engineers just throw all their effort into them and and, and try and design out the, this architect's dream right away. <laughs> push it to the end, push it to the end, and push it to the end. So then they have to make a decision before you actually spend any time on it. That's a great question. <laughs> everyone has been there you know we we have a finite budget uh, we know that things change uh, you know th this whole term value engineering how long has value engineering been around you you and I are about the same age yeah exactly value engineering so uh, I look at those kinds of elements on buildings and, and we do tend to do the same thing you know I'll, I'll give them exact you know just what they need to help make some decisions you know give them some framing give them some concepts and then kind of back away from it and let it sit there <clears throat> and if it's a negotiator, somehow they're doing some pricing and we have an internal cost consultant going, um, we'll figure out if that's really something they want to do or not. Uh, so that's t generally the case. We sort of try to manage the time spent on those high design features because, uh, because they do are, are a little bit more prone to change. Uh, my practice uh, in Minnesota and uh, throughout the country is, 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 is really uh, related to higher design projects, one of a kind. I don't do a lot of big box retail, for instance. Uh, I have a very strong engineering to t tech ratio on my staff. Uh, we do a lot. It's, it's more a, a, an engineering experience than it is a production shop. And, and so we're constantly dealing with that very question. Where do we spend our time? And all of us have that question. How do we triage through the list of items we have to do on our list that day? But uh, I also want to make sure that our clients uh, have the information they need to make uh, a, a competent decision, that their owners, their clients, have, have that information in a timely way. But I, I do manage the time so that we can hopefully be profitable on the project. So I, I thought about this comment. It's kind of uh, uh, words that kind of kick around in my head a lot. To err is human, but to forgive is divine. And we talked a little bit. You mentioned this gentleman mentioned Robert uh, a little earlier about how maybe uh, there is a you know maybe a higher calling in in earlier uh, in an earlier part of our our century with regard to how we we live and respond to our environment. But what 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 this strikes me, and I I try to practice this in my own practice is is 
the words contrition come to me a lot. How powerful is contrition in your organization, in your interpersonal relationships? And um, con contrition can, can build, can bond, can cause healing. And, and these are characteristics I think are very, very important in a functional organization. Uh, in my office in Minneapolis, we have about 50 people, men and women. All we do is uh, structural engineering. And no one's perfect. And, and uh, uh, my office manager will tell you that I am very high maintenance because uh, I'm, I'm very demanding and I want things, I want them now, and sometimes I go over the line. And a number of years ago, I asked her to help me manage myself. <laughs> and, and so uh, we had the red star, gold star deal, and so she had a little calendar item. She, she, the, she'd rip off the piece of paper on the calendar, and, and every now and then in my inbox, at the end of the day, I get a red star. <laughs> And so I go back and try to figure out what I did, and uh, I talk to her about it. And, and uh, if I needed to ask her for forgiveness, I did, and apologize or something. So, but I have seen that be a real powerful characteristic uh, in my relationships with my staff and my relationships with my clients. So I challenge you to think about that, that notion, as you think about your practice, because uh, it, it only builds and causes healing. It doesn't tear down, and it, it's not negative. Um, so I have a little case study, um, and I, I wanted to kind of run through it with you, and I, I wanted to maybe read some of the, the details of it, if I can find that. So we, we talked a little bit about case study as we advertised this. Um, but some of the key features here was that the, this is a structural steel frame building, okay? Five stories, uh, fast track, negotiated general contractor. And let me just read a little bit of the detail, and we can talk about it. This is a five-story building that was under construction. And this is a real case, this is a real live issue. The owner was pushing everyone for the fastest possible building completion. There were incentives to place the con uh, in place for the contractor to meet or beat the construction schedule. And there were also penalties, liquidated damages, you're probably familiar with that, for not meeting the schedule. The steel connections were designed by the design engineer and were shown at various degrees of completion in the DD sets, the mail order set, and then finalized in the CD set. Uh, Fabrication steel shop drawings were started based on the DD phase drawings. Kind of an interesting point to remember. Portions of the submitted steel shop drawings were rejected based on inaccurate connections of key elements. The girders and collector connections to brace frames did not match the design drawings. A design engineer from the engineer records office visited the site and found that construction had advanced based on the unapproved shop drawings and that the connections that were rejected had been installed as shown on the rejected shop drawings. At the expense of the AE firm, the design engineer proceeded to evaluate the existing connections for the design loads. The connections were found to be well under design on order of 40 to 50 percent. The evaluation was based on taking uh, as much conservatism as possible out by using as many reductions as allowed by code. The existing connections could not be justified by the design engineer. The communication between the general contractor and the design engineer became strained and difficult. The general contractor started to not return calls and appeared to not uh, be addressing the issue, but was pressing on ahead to meet or beat the schedule. Starting to sound familiar to anyone? A senior engineer from the office of the EOR started to document all conversation with follow-up memos that were distributed by email. All documents were copied to the EOR, the AE firm's in-house lawyer, the steel fabricator and the general contractor. There was no evidence that the issue was being addressed by the general contractor or the steel fabricator. The owner was not aware of the problem. The leadership at the AE firm wanted repeat business and was trying to go the extra mile as much as possible to not inhibit the schedule. The lawyer of the AE firm called a meeting with the senior engineer and said, you, this is quoting now, the lawyer, you have to stop with the memos and the emails. You're creating a paper trail. What is, worst, what is the worst thing that could happen if the connections are left as is and covered up with sheetrock? This is real. These are real words. This is re this, this, these are real people that were experiencing this. The engineer explained that it was not an option and would not happen. The connections were too far under, under design. The lawyer continued to discuss company risk, company liability, company responsibility and that the AE firm had completed its responsibility as contracted. The lawyer continued to ask and press the senior engineer. I understand there are factors of safety built into the design loads. What if nothing is done and the building gets built that way? 
The company lawyer strongly suggested to the senior engineers to stop all communication about the steel connections based on the fact that the AE firm had shown them on CDs, reviewed the shop drawings, and written uh, the field inspection report. The engineer left the meeting discouraged and disappointed. Called the building official. Explained to the building official in a few words that the contractor had built the steel uh, frame based on unapproved shop drawings. The connections were under design. The contractor appears to be ignoring the problem. Construction is advancing. That he was concerned and that there is a lot of pressure from the owner to complete the building as quickly as possible. The building official visited the site. Soon after the visit, the general contractor hired their own PE to design field fixes for the connections. The field fixes were submitted and uh, submitted the shop drawings, reviewed by the design engineer and approved. The schedule was uninterrupted and the building was constructed according to the drawing to the best of the engineer's knowledge. That engineer left, left that company a couple months later. It's, it's, it's an interesting story. It, it, it's, uh, uh, I know this gentleman, and uh, I won't share any names, but uh, I, I was very impressed with the courage that that took to, uh, to get to that point. So uh, it's, it's an interesting study in connection design and personal responsibility of courage. Sometimes even that happens in our, in our, uh, in our world. And I spend a lot of time with lawyers in my position with my firm. Uh, not that I really want to. I, I, I like lawyers outside their lawyering. <laughs> but you get, get them into the lawyering mode and the lawyering hat on. And I, I don't know how many over-lawyered contracts I've read in my career. But that, the, I, I don't mean to be disparaging about attorneys because the attorneys in that particular example were, were looking and processing the information from their perspective. Had we met the contractual obligation? Are we looking at carrying on a, a higher level of risk because we're going over a line that they, they felt was being crossed? But as, as engineers, and I think a couple of you have mentioned today, there's maybe a higher calling for us in how we evaluate our performance. Go ahead. Sure, sure. As engineer record, I, I strongly believe, even if you had delayed connection design, like it happened in this case, you, you are still responsible for that connection. I don't know if there's a whole lot of disagreement here, but that's my personal opinion of that. The lawyer also just widely overlooked the fact Things that situation. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Number one, I, I do not care for post-install connectors intention. <laughs> Anyone else agree with me here? <laughs> no, exactly. Um, good, good observation. I, I'm sure all of us have had those kind of challenges. Uh, certainly finding and, and pre-qualifying uh, special inspectors is really important. Uh, I find with my special inspector relationships, particularly in Minnesota, that they're, they're long. They're, I, I've had them for a long time. Um, I, I, I maybe deviate a bit from uh, case in, in terms of being overly prescriptive. Uh, I want to pick a good partner in the special inspections side of life and I want them to run it and I want them to pick their, their people and pick their appropriate uh, testing procedures that are consistent with the uh, performance specification that I have in the testing form of the, uh, on the specification. Um, I, I, I'm not interested in having, uh, you know, pre prescribe exactly where the, the dead sea tester is going to take in the, in the backfill. I want to make sure the backfill meets my specification. 
and I want the testing company to be responsible for making appropriate uh, choices about who does that work, where they do that work, and when they do that work. Um, accountability, right? That's partly what we're talking about today. Well, we came and we tested. Here's the test report, but the backfill settled six inches. So I, I, I agree with that. Anyway, I thought that was an interesting story I wanted to share with everyone this morning because it, it uh, I know, like I said, I know this gentleman. Uh, he's a very, very ethical person. Uh, a person with probably about 18, 19 years as a structural engineer, a very confident structural engineer. And he, he was faced with this, this difficult choice. Now some may not always be always that clear, but we make choices like this every day. Go ahead. Uh, it's a good question. I, I don't know all the details to that. Uh, 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 you know, from what I understand in, the, in the, these circumstances, those questions were asked, emails were sent, fabricators were copied. Um, but maybe the, the decision to, to meet a schedule, and, and you know how we have all, as structural engineers and fabricators and detailers, been pushed hard by contractors, pushed real hard by contractors. Where I, 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 talk, I talk about contractors raising a schedule and, and, uh, and cost estimate into an art form. Uh, you know, that's their world. And, and it, it is very frustrating when you find that you know, you're, you're not having enough time to do your work. And I'm a champion of those words, and I share that a lot with, on, on behalf of my staff. And periodically, and right now, I, I used to spend a lot of time on the deck if you know what I mean by that. A lot of time on construction sites, I, I don't anymore because I remember I had to spend the time with the lawyers. But periodically when questions, issues get a little out of hand, I show up at a job site and I try to find out why and, and uh, provide some guidance in terms of thinking about you know, spend, having enough time to do our work, having enough time to review our shop drawings and uh, provide a confidence level service. Go ahead. Presumably, the general contractor uh, paid for the services of of, uh, of the uh, engineer that he hired to reevaluate those connections, and uh, the fabricator that provided the material and the erector that provided the work were paid for by the general contractor, as I understand it. So, I understand there were no claims that came out of that process, and uh, I understand the contractor was also on time with completion of the project. There were liquidated damages. All of us know what liquidated damages are. Uh, somewhat of a, obviously a, a disincentive for for failure, um, but but uh, those those kinds of uh, uh, f uh, features within the contract can can cause uh, uh, or, or place maybe a too high an emphasis on on uh, completion over safety, and that seemed like it kind of gripped this project for quite a while. Anyway, I'm sorry. <laughs> That's a great question. <laughs> Everyone hear the question? Can you consider liquidated damages as, a, as, as an ethical issue? Or it, we'll say your question again. Right. We have to live with the project for a lot of years, don't we, as structural engineers? In the state of Minnesota, the, uh, the statute of repose, the statute of, uh, uh, is, is on the order of 10 years plus two years for discovery. That's why I'm always encouraging our staff to have a good set of documents and a good record where folks like us, me, have to go back and look at it at a later time. Um, not that we have, you know, a huge level of claims. We actually have a very, you know, we, we've been in business for 55 years. So you know, it's saying business for 55 years, a lot of claims, but uh, claims are a part of our lives, uh, everyone here, and, and it's, it's a reality. And we have to have a good, competent record. And so doing the right thing, even if it, if it compromises the schedule, is, is what we need to do. And, and we certainly don't want to be in the position where we're in, in the line of fire for a claim because of delay. One thing we did, actually I, I provided some expert witness work a number of years ago, uh, kind of related to um, uh, some forensic work I was doing. And I spent some time with my lawyer in that particular case. Had had spent a fair amount of time defending uh, a kind of unique case, one of a time case in Minnesota re related to a design professional who was found uh, to have delayed the project due to sh you know shop drawing review process. And so, uh, learning about that, I, I instituted a, a, a log in my own office. This goes back a couple decades now. I track every shop drawing that comes into my office 
for whatever project it is, and then my assistant will issue a report every week to understand what the day is. You know, so she gets you know it's a large spreadsheet, and we make sure that we're responding. That that could be the basis of a claim if we're not responding in a timely fashion. Make sure that you put reasonable amounts of time in your specification for review, so you do have time to do your work, and and don't be too willing to accept something that's incomplete. To the extent that you can return a set of shop drawings that isn't complete because the detailer just was pounded to get it out because it's a schedule again and it wasn't complete, cycle it back. Be willing to take a, a bit of a risk making sure that people are, are, are doing their work. Um, we, we culturally in our office, uh, especially with people we know, have had a tendency to try to uh, complete the shop drawings sometimes. Does that sound familiar? <laughs> And, and I, I'm trying to move our group away from that, particularly in our higher profile, more complicated projects because uh, we want to make sure that we're all doing our work and we have time to do our work and the, and the final shop drawing is, 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 is complete and responsive to the contract documents. Anyway. I, I did a little bit of just research on kind of knowing ourselves and, and so kind of looking at a couple of approaches about operating philosophy. So we kind of touch on moral compass and goals and behavior. So um, there, maybe there were three categories that is sort of class, classified here, the pragmatic or the physical, and you might, you know, might relate it to a left brain, right brain. <laughs> uh, we are left brainers mostly here in this room. We're analytical, we're problem solvers. <clears throat> uh, and so uh, useful determines, uh, usefulness determines worth, measurement to determine value, and individualistic, maybe you can see yourself in some of those words. Competencies include self-management and seeking value. Uh, a, a second category was intellectual or, or thinking. Decisions are based on logic. This sounds a bit familiar like engineers. Reason and accepted benchmarks stresses a cognitive competencies uh, that include predictiveness and analyticalness. And then maybe the right brain, which we all have, uh, you know, there's that, a little softer side of ourselves. Creative, human feeling, family and friends are more important than other relationships. Worth is measured by the impact on close relationships. Competencies would include social awareness, relationship management, and, and, and loyalty. So, uh, I have a couple more questions here. Everyday ethics decisions. My desire to achieve financial results, are, are they so strong that I behave as if the end justifies the mean, means again? Take a couple minutes just to throw an, an answer on there. Okay, that, that's kind of consistent with some of the themes we've been talking about today at, from an engineering perspective, maybe <clears throat> where we see a bit of a higher calling uh, that, that, that drives our, that, that shapes our moral compass, if you will. Second question, my desire for high performance leads me to lack compassion, say for a fellow employee whose family crisis takes him or her away from work at a critical time. Maybe that means that, that I have to do more work, or I have to spend more time, uh, more time uh, with less resources because of a personal relationship. How do we feel about that? <clears throat> okay. And uh, final question here. Oops. Um, my need for economic security discourages me from speaking out with integrity about an unethical corporate practice. How about this gentleman? I just told you his story. How would you react in those same same circumstances? Excellent. Um, my my office my uh, uh, marketing director put this slide. I thought it was kind of cute. Conventional conventional conventionality is not morality. You know, uh, running with the tribe, doing it because everyone else is doing it. You know, it's it's so it's so easy, and it could it could compromise your ethics, and no one would even know. Uh, Manage behavior, compliance-related uh, concept. If it's legal, is it ethical? Just because a particular choice is legal does not make it right. Seeing legal compliance as a goal of ethics rather than the starting point can lead to poor decision making with disastrous consequences for the individuals involved and their organizations. Compliance is essential, but it's not enough. So 
question to ask ourselves. Is it more important to always behave, uh, make judgments, and execute decisions based on ethical principles, even at the risk of financial, of reduced financial return? Excellent. But there's some maybes in there. Uh, question and answer ourselves, do we, do we regularly endorse and promote the basic principles of ethical behavior embodied in the organization? Do we think about it? Do we, do we allow it to kind of weave into our thinking about behaviors or decisions that we need to make on a daily basis? Good. Um, so we talk about making business decisions. <coughs> And, and sort of three key words kind of appear to me, you know, and, and called transparency, effective, and, and fairness. So can you ask yourself as you make a decision um, from the transparency, and I shared with you a little bit about our transparency in terms of our, our, our own corporate culture, do I and others knowing what I have decided? You know, are you open, is your email open to everybody? Uh, what effect does it have? Does, it, does, does my decision affect or hurt? anyone in my organization. How, how fair is this? Would my decision be considered fair by those affected by it? Um, Stephen Covey, anyone heard of Stephen Covey? Wrote, wrote a new book, maybe some of you read it, Speed of Trust. I was, I was really taken by some of the words that uh, Covey uses. Uh, one of the areas of, uh, that we're exploring as a new practice uh, characteristic of our firm is integrated practice, integrated project delivery. Some of you have heard of that. There's been some discussion about that this week. Uh, some of you may have descend, uh, attended e-construction on Tuesday. Uh, it was really an excellent presentation by a number of <clears throat> people who credit the state of the art of where that's at. But you know what? E-construction and integrated project delivery require significant investments in trust. So I, I was impressed with some of the words that are, are used here in, in Covey's uh, presentation. Trusting relationships are built on ethical behavior, and they have the same kind of words that we've been talking about today. Uh, transparency, uh, uh, that kind of culture rights wrongs, doesn't let them sit there. It takes action to correct, uh, delivers results, you're reliable, uh, confronts reality, we're not delusional. Uh, if it takes 10 days to do this, let's make sure we get 10 days to do our work, to do it right. Uh, it's accountable, that, that we are accountable for our actions, for, the, for our activities, that if there is a problem, that we correct it. Uh, thinking about uh, an earlier document created, uh, written by a gentleman named Tom Peters, uh, the book is called, I'm thinking of it's called In Search of Excellence, the early 1980s. And he talks about solving, problem solving at the level that is created at. Integrated project delivery has similar characteristics. We're trying to borrow from what's been successfully used in manufacturing for years and bring it into our industry and try to capture some, some of the, if, if, uh, try to lose some of the inefficiencies in our industry that cost billions of dollars. Uh, and it's reliable that, you, that what you say you will do, you will do. Trust saves time, trust saves money. Uh, Covey uses the example of going to the airport before 911. Go to the airport before 911, but you, know, you arrive a half an hour early, just zip right through and you're at your gate. Today, what, what is it? It's an hour and a half because uh, of trust. We don't know who's, who's traveling with us. And so we have to verify Th that cost. If you think about uh, the speed of trust if, if, in our own relationships, these are some, these are some powerful words and some powerful concepts. I encourage you to get the book and, 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 and read it. So what can companies do? Ethical behavior starts at the top. I strongly believe that personally in my own practice. Build and maintain trust, ensuring the integrity of professional responsibilities, ethical role modeling, mentoring, uh, from the leadership, respect. That, that, that can be seen and is clearly demonstrated by the leadership of your organization. Uh, build consensus and, and, and demonstrate integrity. Clarity of mission, no hidden agendas. Uh, zero tolerance for certain behaviors, and I mentioned the kind of behaviors that I would drop my pencil, turn my uh, phone off, get up and take action right away. 
zero tolerance. Corporate code of ethics. Uh, establish a framework for business decisions, uh, uh, making that. Uh, making that integrates ethics, uh, that make, <laughs> integrates ethics, sorry. Encourage pushback. Develop a culture of dissent. Encourage people to come to you and say, I'm having a problem. Uh, a number of years ago, uh, one of my clients uh, called me on a, on a project that I wasn't involved with that, that indicated that, the, that the, their structural engineer was having a problem with an iron worker. I happen to know this iron worker. He was pretty contentious. <laughs> and he said, how do we, ha how do we handle this? And so I shared some ideas about, uh, about confronting the behavior and, uh, and I think they took some action and, and it, it healed itself. Um, identity and managed conflicts of interest. Making sure that you're transparent in your relationships. I have a relationship uh, right now. I have, I have three contracts on the, twin, the new Twin Stadium. I'm working for Walter P. Moore, the engineer of record. I'm working for M.A. Mortensen, the contractor of record. And uh, I'm working for the steel fabricator. So I have th these three disparate contracts. Everyone knows that I have these relationships. I have separate teams working in each of those relationships. But everyone was, I, I advised all, uh, all my clients about those relationships and everyone felt comfortable with that as we did. Uh, make sure that you identify those conflicts of interest early and talk about them. Ethics training. <clears throat> Establish a culture of character. Define ethical behavior clearly. Uh, listen. Have a listening mode, have a listening heart. Two ears, one mouth. Uh, communicate regularly. Lead by example and walk the talk. You know, corporate conduct must be taken seriously. Corporate values and ethics must come from the top, must be monitored. Staff involvement in the content and impl implementation of the code. Uh, have staff buy-in. Uh, what one of the features that we have with our organization is our is our committees. Uh, committees. We 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 want people to be involved in our practice as deeply as they can and as early in their professional career as possible. Um, just having, however, a code of ethics is not enough. It has to be real, a real benefit. The code must uh, be understood, built into the business structure, used, monitored, and reevaluated, making sure that it's staying contemporary and responsive to the needs of the organization. Doing the right thing is good business. Corporate moral compass, deeply held beliefs that drive personal and business lives. We were talking a little bit about that earlier today. Being honest no matter what. Being responsible and accountable for one's actions. Caring about the welfare of subordinates, of those uh, uh, in your organization that are new, that are learning the business. We have a strong commitment in my organization to bring interns in during, you know, part time. Uh, during their school experience to, to help balance their academic experience with, with real life and real engineering. Uh, owning up to mistakes and failures. <laughs> Bad news does not improve with age. Take action right away. I have a client, this is a little bit off color, but I have a client that used to say, if you've got to eat a turd, don't nibble. <laughs> Doing the right thing is good business. Start discussing ethical issues in the work environment. Uh, and make the case for fair trade coffee. Uh, uh, just a brief comment that, that, con that consumers can influence ethical behavior by, the way, by their buying patterns. And this is a great example. Uh, so basic ethical principles, this came from a presentation, a European presentation I came across uh, recently. It's strenuous, it, 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 uh, it values trust, it's curious, it has ambition, it's, fr it's frugal and loyal and prudent and correct, punctual and, cl and clear, clarity of speech, strong sense of vision and entrepreneurship. Uh, this is somewhat historic, codes of ethics have been around for quite a while. Uh, there's some neat comments in here, loyalty to the country, uh, uh, avoid misleading statements, disclosure of possible biases. This is, this is uh, earlier part of the century. So some of the words are still contemporary. The thoughts are contemporary, the words are a little bit dated. Be fair and professional advancement. How am I doing here? And then the final, final slide on, on, this is from the 1954 National Society of Professional Engineers Engineer's Creed. I'll just read this, as the words are really, really cool. Um, as a professional engineer, I dedicate my professional knowledge and skill to the advancement and betterment of human welfare. I pledge to give the utmost performance, to participate in none but honest enterprises, to live and work according to the laws of man and the highest standards of professional conduct, to place service above profit, the honor and standing of the profession before personal advantage, 
and the public welfare above all other consideration. In humility and with the need for divine guidance, we talked about that, I, I make this pledge. Those are powerful words. Uh, they're a little dated, but the thought and the uh, impact is very contemporary. So that's nine, it's 9.30. Uh, thank you all for your participation and interest in this topic. I really do wish you the best in your organizations and your professional careers. Take a few of these points, take them back with you, make some changes, have an influence in your organization. Uh, uh, strive for a functional, honest uh, relationships in your, in your professional career that, that uh, will bring value to you and those around you. Thank you very much. Can I get everybody just to answer these first three questions, please?